What incredible music and incredible testimony this morning. I have a question for you, and some of you can answer yes to this, but I'd like to see how many of you have ever flown first class? Not that many. I, I am envious of you. I have always flown economy or business class. I flew that one time, and I could see well into first class. But I want to talk about grace this morning in the sense that God's grace allows us to live life in a first-class way, but we choose instead to live economy. Let's talk about that for a few minutes. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Found in the epistle to the, Galatians, uh, to the Ephesians, rather, the first chapter, the third verse says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose Christ, chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. That's, that's in Jesus. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is God's word for we the people of God. Thanks and blessed be his name. You may be seated. I mentioned to you that I was able to look up into first class and there was a couple of things up there that really impressed me. One of the first things that impressed me was those folks get on the airplane first and from the moment they step on the airplane, their need, their every need is taken care of. Uh, that may have not been your experience, but that's what it looked like to me sitting back where I was. I also noticed that up there that they had one flight attendant for 14 or 15 folks while the three in the back took care of the other 150 of us. Of taking care of our need when they could get around to it. Now that's not their fault, and it's not our fault, but how often it is that so often that we receive God's grace and how often God claims us, as the, the epistle this morning, the Ephesians, uh, the writing to the Ephesians have said, God has claimed us, has adopted us, has made us his own, and yet we still live, and we still work and live in that grace as if that we're in the economy section. There's a reason for that, I think. One of the reasons that I think that that happens to so many of us is that we never mature beyond receiving and accepting the grace of God and never learn how to live into it. Now, what am I talking about there? I'm talking about that the only way really to experience God's grace and the fullness that God meant for us to have it is to live that out toward others and extend that grace to them of what we have received of simply living that out that it becomes real and it becomes personal in our own lives of giving it away. Jessica, it's just what you were talking about. It's about giving it away. How often it is that we have received this grace and it is so good and it is so personal that we decide that we're going to simply keep it to ourselves. Now, I'm going to say to you a couple of things and don't misunderstand them. 
So many of us live out our grace as if it's something that I feel. I, I feel it. I've got to feel this grace. And there is some truth in that. You need to feel it. You need to experience it. The experiential is really a part of it. But folks, there are so many mornings that when I wake up that I'm dealing with the problems of life, of with family, of with community, of with the problems of the world, that there's some mornings I wake up with an attitude that I don't feel like a Christian. Somebody has done something that has so upset me that that in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, how can I get even with him? I know you all never do that. But your preacher does that ever so often. He's thinking, how, how can I rectify this? How can I make sure that I don't look like the bad guy in this? That's unfair. Life is unfair. Why is all this so unfair? And so relying upon my feelings, if I act on that, there's one thing I don't do. When I act out what I think and what I feel, and rather than allowing the grace of God to cover over that, what I'm doing is I'm, I don't honor God at all in that. And that's really what Paul is talking about here, is about that in the things that we do and in the way that we honor God is how we relate and how we act and how we respond to one another, is living out God's grace. We can be pretty selfish. Oh, we don't mean to be. Uh, sometimes. Sometimes we really don't mean to be that selfish. Sometimes we really want to respond to other folks because of what we might get back in return of offering them something. I'm reminded of a story about a preacher that was going on a, uh, for a seminar, a learning seminar, and he, as he got on the airplane, he said he remembered as he walked through the first class section that he remembered the older couple sitting on the left. He didn't really pay that much attention to them, but he, he was filing on with everybody else, and he went back and took his seat and said as other people began to file on, suddenly up there in that part of the airplane, there was a, the line just stopped. Two soldiers had gotten on the airplane, and as they had gotten to the older couple's seat, he could see that there was a lot of conversation going on, and the, and the attendant was trying to work with them, and, and he was wondering, what in the world is going on up there? And finally, they seemed to get whatever was wrong resolved, and the older couple got up and came back and sat down next to him. That's where the soldiers would have sat had they taken their rightful place. And as the airplane is finally gets flying he looked over at them and said I don't mean to be nosy but what in the world happened up there just a few minutes ago did you all take somebody's seat and they wanted them back and the older couple said this to him he said no he said my wife and I travel we've traveled for the last several years i was very successful in business and so we were very blessed to be able to travel and we never travel anywhere that we don't travel first class we always book first class seats he said but whenever we travel whenever a soldier gets on the same airplane that we get on we always offer them our seats and we let them travel first class it blesses us to do that and this fellow said i thought about that a minute and I, I said to them but traveling this way is not very comfortable it's not as comfortable as it is up there in first class and said the fellow looked at me and said well sometimes where these folks serve is not very comfortable either and so if we can make their life a little better that's part of our ministry to them do you think god was honored in that sort of action where that somebody gives up something that it would it brought a little bit of discomfort there was some sacrifice in it and yet they were able to give to these folks that perhaps that the folks that received were surprised at, at least and grateful at most that somebody thought of them in that way Folks, the grace that we have received, the salvation that we claim, the, 
the forgiveness that we have experienced. When we have received all of that, then our job becomes to become a blessing to others. You see, that's what the Jewish folks, when God, if you will go back to the Old Testament, this is not a new thought that Paul is bringing forth here. It is a thought that went back to the days of Abraham. God said, I'm going to raise you up as a nation, and your job is to be a blessing to other nations to honor and glorify me. And those folks forgot that. Church, if we ever forget that, if we ever forget that God has raised us up simply to offer his grace and forgiveness, if we ever forget that we are to be a blessing to those around us so that God might be honored, we just as well might take the word Christian out of our name because we have simply become a social club meant for our own comfort, for our own purposes. Now, I don't see Mount Pleasant Church doing that because I see a lot of what you do in this community. A food pantry going to Honduras. Missionaries throughout the world. And there's personal things that you do for one another that you don't talk about, but I know about. Somebody said to me one day, he said, how do you know all this stuff? And I said, don't you know I've got a direct line to God. He tells me everything. <laughs> they did the same thing you're doing. They laughed at that. But the thing about it is, is that's how that it's to be lived out. Now, I will say this to you. It's difficult. This grace is difficult sometimes to live out because sometimes there's folks that intentionally do things toward you and me. Why they do them, we don't, I don't deal with that question anymore. But I do know that God wants me to offer forgiveness just as God has offered forgiveness to me. God wants you to move into that place in your life that your faith is maturing, that you're growing. And not that you're just a stepping stone for folks, but that you're honoring God in trying to lead others to know the forgiveness, the humility, and the grace. There's a little-known novel out there. I think they're going to make a movie out of it. It's called Les Miserables. I don't know if you've ever heard of that or not. But there's a part in that movie that Valjean, who is a convict, he escapes from prison and a, a, a bishop takes him in, takes him into his home, gives him a bath, feeds him at his own table, lets him sleep in a bed there in his own home. And Valjean is struggling with all these demons within him, all the doubts, and, and he's afraid. And so in the, mid, in the middle of the night, what he does is he gets up, and the very one that had helped him, this kindly bishop, Valjean, goes downstairs into the kitchen and begins to fill a bag with all the silver, with all the things that are valuable in that dining room. And then he leaves the house and he's caught by the police who then call the bishop and they come face to face. And here's the gist of that conversation when they come face to face. Do you know this man? Yes, I took him into my home. Is this the silver from your home? Yes, this is the silver from my home. And I am very, very angry. I am angry. He took this silver from my home, but he forgot the candlesticks. And he sent one of the housekeepers back to his house to get the candlesticks so that he might give Valjean not just part of the silver, but all. Now that sounds messed up, don't it? That sounds really messed up. Valjean was a little bit surprised by it too, and he says to the bishop, why did you do this? And the bishop says, for a few pieces of silver, I have bought your soul. You owe me. But most of all, you owe God. Because this grace that I'm extending to you is not from me. It is from God. It 
It's amazing to me what a kind word, what a kind action, what a piece of grace can do to a life. It's amazing. And it's amazing to have some, the flesh and blood of each one of you to pass that along to somebody that may have never experienced it. Or may have experienced it a hundred times. Who knows? God is calling us today, folks, to live this out. Now, I mentioned to you a few minutes ago that we do these, we do these wonderful things for, for other folks. But also, I think it, wouldn't be, it would be unfair for me just to say that that's a great thing. Because I think we need to ask ourselves the question, why do we do it? Do we do it because it makes us, us feel good? Or do we do it because it honors God for what God has offered to each of us? Why do we do what we do? Because I can. Not because that I, and some of you are saying, well, gosh, I don't, I don't really have anything to offer. I just have a little bit to offer. A little bit of time, a little bit of resources, a little bit of, well, folks, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, sometimes becomes a great deal that we're able to pass on to others. We talk a great deal about redemption. We talk about forgiveness. We talk about grace. And these are wonderful themes. They're incredible themes. But they are worthless themes if all we've done is to understand that they're meant just for us. These themes only become reality when we, uh, when we have received that and when we practice that toward others. Jesus came, folks, to reach the least, the lonely, and the last. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've been there. Some of you may have not been to that place yet. He came to lift up the weak, the outcast, and those who simply didn't know, that needed to know different things. Our lives can get banged up. There's not a person under the sound of my voice this morning that hasn't had a period in your life that some of you just got, you got a little dinged. Some of you got more than dinged. You had major, major, major destruction. But the scripture tells us this morning, hear this word again, that God has lavished the riches of his grace. Hear that, has lavished the riches of his grace. And claimed us to be his children. Our challenge, folks, is to not only receive that gift, but to live as if we have. Young people, you're going to hear this from the pulpit here a million times. I hope you don't ever get tired of hearing it. And the rest of you will hear it also, but the young people especially. Life is about choices. Those who have lived as long as I have know that if I could go back, I would change some of my choices. There's some I wouldn't. A lot I wouldn't. But there's some that I would. Because I based it just off of what I felt. A word spoken in exasperation and frustration Give me that word back. A choice to, to do it. A choice to exclude someone that I didn't really know, but that I found out later would have been an incredible experience just to know them. A choice sometimes to do the wrong thing rather than that which I knew was right. When the Israelite people were coming out of the wilderness, getting ready to cross the Jordan, and they were standing there, and Joshua, who was leading those folks, called them together. And what he did is he, he in, in, if you read that scripture, 
you will see that there's a litany of things that he simply names off. Uh, this is what, this, these are the choices that we have. This, uh, what he did, he said, this is what God has done. God has fed us in the wilderness. God has brought us out of Egypt. God has delivered us and all the things. And he said, this is all that God has done. And those are things of the past. And now here in the present, we're faced with a choice because that's going to affect what we do in the future. And he asked the question I'm going to ask you this morning. What are you going to do with this grace? That's actually, that's what he said was, will you serve the gods of Egypt, the former gods, or will you serve the God that has led us to this place? But the choice, what I would say to you this morning is to rephrase that question is, what are you going to do with this grace? that God has given you. Are you going to take it and hold it within you and I will tell you what will happen to it. It will die because grace and love and forgiveness cannot grow unless it sees the light and the life of day. What are you going to do with it? Joshua said that day, as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. As for you and your house, will you receive the grace and live it out as God has offered it? That's your choice, yes or no. Pray with me, would you?